formation zone that is the most common site of malignancy and uh, the, the most common site of um, initiation of malignancy, especially of the cervix. Okay, so that's very, very important, your transformation zone. The uterus will be, the size of the uterus will be dependent upon the parity of the woman. In the nulliparous woman, it's approximately 8 by 5 by 2.5, roughly 40 to 50 grams. But in the multiparous woman, it's usually 20 to 30 grams heavier and it is 1.2 centimeters larger. The position you have, uh, the normal position of the uterus could be antiverted, antiflex, retroverted, or retroflex, depending on its relationship with the long axis of the uterus, the entire uterus, with that of the vagina, if it's version, and antiflexion with, in relation to the long axis with the cervix. So again, what you need to take note of here will be the position where the fundus is directed. If it's directed towards the bladder, then it's ante. The surname is either version or flexion will depend upon the relationship of the long axis of the body of the uterus with the vagina and with the body of the uterus with the long axis of the cervix in the um, anteflexion. Retroversion or retroflexion is the same, but the fundus is just directed towards the rectum. It's also a normal anatomical variation of the position of the uterus. The afferent nerve fibers from the uterus enter the spinal cord from T11 to T12 so that referred pain is located in the lower abdomen. No? So usually be like the pain coming from this menorrhea. So the arterial blood supply of the uterus comes from the uterine and ovarian arteries. So from the ovarian artery, which is a direct branch of the aorta, and from the internal ilia, uh, from the uterine artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac or the internal hypogastric artery. Okay, so it also gives off branches to the vagina and of, to the cervix. What is important to take note of is that the ovarian vein drains into the right ovarian vein, drains in, directly into the inferior vena cava, whereas the left ovarian drain, vein drains into the left vena vein before draining into the superior, inferior vena cava. If the, there's gluteal ischemia at the time of hypogastric artery ligation, like in patients who had postpartum hemorrhage, like the one that we discussed, but the one that is responsible for that is that it, the superior gluteal artery might have been ligated, okay, during the time of um, hypogastric artery ligation. So also important to take note of are the Gartner's ducts, which are found on the lateral walls of the vagina. The greater vestibular ducts, glands, or the Bartholin's gland are found at the 4 and 8 o'clock position of the vulva. No? So this is important because it might, they might present with cyst or abscesses, which is commonly seen at the 4 and 8 o'clock position. If it's just a cyst, it usually present with just a mass in the vulva. No? If there's pain or tenderness or even erythema of that area with fever, then it could be an abscess already. Okay, the ovaries, on the other hand, uh, measure approximately 1 by 2.5 by 4 centimeters. Again, the appearance of the ovaries will depend on the stage where the patient is in, whether she's menopausal or in the reproductive age. But the ovary is usually found in a depression in the peritoneum known as the fossa ovarica, so it's posterior. And the mobility of the ovary is um, um, dictated by the ones that support it, so your mesovarium, the ovarian ligament, or the utero-ovarian ligament, it's the same, and the infundibulopelvic ligament. So the mesovarium is just a peritoneal covering that is continuous actually with the mesosalpings, but the mesovarium is closer to the ovary. The ovarian ligament supports the, um, connects the uterus and the ovary together. And the infundibular pelvic ligament is coming from the pelvic side wall. So it contains the ovarian vessels, artery, and the nerves. No? So the extent of collateral circulation, if you do your internal iliac ligation, no, can be coming from the aorta, the external iliac, and the femoral arteries. That's why even if you do 
inter, um, hypogastric, internal hypogastric artery ligation during PPH, you are not going to be afraid of that the lower part of the uterus becoming necrotic because of the extensive collateral circulation coming from these other vessels that are present. Okay. So um, another thing that is very important will be your pelvic diaphragm. No? So the, the levator ani constitute the greatest bulk of the pelvic diaphragm. Okay, so it's very important that you know the components of your levator ani, which comprises your probocoxidus, your ischiocoxidus in the muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. Okay, the urogenital diaphragm support the urethra and the urethrovesical junction that maintains um, continence in women. No? So these are the external genital muscles whose primary function appears to be sexual. So your ischiocavernosus, the bulbocavernosus, and the superficial transverse perineal. The two muscles that constitute your levator ani muscles are your pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus. Sometimes, if you remember your anatomy, your ischiococcygeus is usually also a muscle that is included in the levator ani, but sometimes it's only ligamento, so it's not usually included. So the innervation from the levator ani comes from your S3 and S5. Okay, next will be the main support of the uterus one. That is the biggest of the ligaments that support the uterus, but offers minor support will be the broad ligament. Now, so the broad ligament contains all of the, the following structures. No? So the fallopian tubes, your utero ovarian, the round ligament, the ureters, the ovarian vessels, and uterine vessels, and parametrial tissue. The cardinal ligaments, however, provide the major support to the uterus, including the uterosacral ligament. Okay, so it's very important that you know how the, this, the ureter will pass through the pelvic cavity during um, your um, dissection during the operation. So the distal ureter enters into the cardinal ligament one to two centimeters lateral to the uterine cervix. So it's very, very close so that if you are going to to ligate the cardinal ligaments, you have to stay close to the uterus in the midline, stay close to the specimen that you're going to remove. So that surgical compromise of the ureters during pelvic surgery may occur during the following, you no know, clamping and ligating of the infundibular pelvic vessels. Now when you ligate the infundibular pelvic ligament, clamping and ligating of the cardinal ligament or suturing the endopelvic fascia during anterior to posterior repair during your pelvic cord and prolapse mm -hmm. surgery. Okay, so that is the one that is important for the anatomy. Um, it's also very important that you remember your pelvimetry. No? So before we go to the embryology, um, I would just like you to to give, give you a brief overview of the pelvis. Can you see the slide? Can you see it? Yes, Doc. So just to give you a brief overview of the male and female pelvis, no? so it's very important that you know the difference between the two. Okay, the majority is will be, of course, no, the, the one that is ideal for childbirth will be the gynecoid pelvis, which will be most commonly seen in female um, pelvises. No? But the males, the main difference will be in your pubic arc. See here, the female pubic arc is um, wider as compared to the subpubic arc in the males. No? So the sacrum also is curved in females as more curved as compared to the males and the mid pelvis, which is demonstrated by the ischial spines, bounded by the ischial spines, is um, more uh, wider as compared to that of males. So that will be very, very important if you're going to take note of it. And again, know the boundaries of the inlet, the the mid pelvis and the outlet of the uterus. Okay, so that's what I want you to remember from the female pelvis. So we're going to go back. So for sexual differentiation, 
Um, you all know this, that the first step in sexual differentiation is the determination of the genetic sex, which is determined during fertilization. Okay, For female sexual development, you don't need the presence of the ovary, so meaning you don't need the presence of the female hormones. So the only thing that is important is that there is no testes and there's no testosterone produced during that time. If there's no testes, no testosterone, that patient will develop female external genitalia. But if you have a testosterone coming from an, an, uh, a source other than the, the gonads of the baby, the baby will develop um, masculinized features or the, the baby will have virilized external genitalia. Okay, so that's very, very important. So by the 12th week age of gestation, the male and female genitalia can be differentiated. And again, in the absence of androgens, the female external genitalia will develop. So if you don't have androgens, you don't have uh, the receptors for those androgens that even if that patient is genetically male, the external genitalia will still be appear as female. So that it's very important that if you're destined to become a male, you have a Y chromosome, the SRY or sex determining region of the Y chromosome will program for the development of testosterone, information of testosterone and the receptors. In the, in the ovaries, the key um, gene in the development of the ovaries will be the DAX1 gene. Okay, so... At the critical point, the AMH produced by the Sertoli cells will cause no, the Mullerian duct system, which is present in both males and female, um, male and female embryos, to undergo apoptosis and death. So that only the Wolfian duct will remain in the males. So aside from the fact that um, you have your SRY determining region that encodes for the uh, testosterone. You also have your MIS, your earlier anti-Molarian hormone, which causes the Molarian ducts to undergo apoptosis and die. Okay, so that by the fourth and six weeks, both males and females will appear the same way. No, so you have your genital tubercle, your labioscrotal folds your urogenital sinus, it will all be the same whether male or female. But afterwards, because of the influence of the different hormones, they will appear different so that your glands in males will elongate, the urethral fold and groove will disappear, your urethral sinus will disappear, and the scrotal swelling will grow laterally. As compared to the females, the urethral fold and the urethral groove will remain patent because that will be the vagina. So as they grow older, so that now you know what are the homolo homologs, no? that the labia majora will be the homologue of the scrotum, and the shaft of the penis is re related to the labia minora. Okay, so these are your embryologic derivatives of your genital structures. These are very, very important. Please take note of them okay, so that you will know what are the male and female counterparts of the different organs, okay? So that anomalies of sex chromosomal complement can result to different abnormalities that might present with amenorrhea, primary amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, or finding of hermaphrodites or hermaphrodites. Androgen insensitivity syndrome occurs in genetic males that are unresponsive to androgen. So it's one of the things that you need to take note of. No, your androgen sensitivity syndrome, the, the patients are male. So that if a patient presents with amenorrhea, okay, with, um, you need to take note of the presence or absence of secondary sexual characteristics. And then no, if there's any abnormality, try to get your um, karyotyping to see if that patient is really a male or a female. So one of the most common findings or causes of amenorrhea or even a second primary amenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea is your Turner syndrome. They, the patients are of short stature and there's usually webbing of neck 
and there's uh, the set development of your secondary sexual characteristics are absent, so there's no breast. However, there could be strict gonads of ovarian development, so that sometimes these patients might have um, a short period of time wherein they have menses, and then they will have premature ovarian failure, or they will have amenorrhea afterwards. The uterus and fallopian tubes are usually infantile. Okay. The next syndrome that you need to differentiate will be your Klinefelter syndrome, which is usually the patient will appear male, but they have XXY, XXXY um, karyotyping. The test is failed to enlarge, and the facial hair is scanty, and the pubic hair is of female distribution, meaning they are of an inverted triangle distribution. They might have some breast development and they are usually infertile. And if you increase the number of X chromosomes as to what is seen in these patients, there will be increased uh, chances of mental retardation. Okay. This one is your androgen sensitivity syndrome. So that these patients are males, 46XY, karyotype, but they, are, um, they appear to be female. So they have breast they have the external genitalia will appear uh, female, but they don't have the uterus. Okay, they don't have any uterus, but they have breasts. The problem with androgen sensitivity syndrome is they produce androgens, but the problem is in their receptor. So if you take the androgen levels, it's normal. The receptors are the ones that are um, the problem. These patients also will usually present with primary amenorrhea, okay? They have normal or large breasts. One that will be a differential diagnosis of these patients who present with primary amenorrhea with the, uh, with the presence of the breast, with the uterus absence, is um, your utero, uh, your mullerian agenesis. In mullerian agenesis, the patients are female. With androgen sensitivity, they are male. Uh, what is important here you know, to take note of is um, they have absent or scanty pubic hair or axillary hair because, as we said, they have no receptors for testosterone. Then testosterone is the main hormone responsible for hair growth and development. Okay, The uterus and tubes are absent, and the testes in these patients are at increased risk of developing tumors. So that by the time the patient will reach the age of maturity at 16 to 18 years old, wherein they have already um, gain, have their, what do you call this, height attain their maximum height, they should undergo removal of the testes because it can undergo malignant transformation. So if you have a normal appearing female but absent uterus, do you have your, the main conditions that are you should think of will be your androgen sensitivity and your Mullerian agenesis. It could easily be differentiated by your karyotyping because one is a girl, the other is a boy, and the appearance of normal hair growth. If it's, there's normal hair growth, you're probably dealing with Mullerian agenesis or your mayer rokitansky kusterhauser syndrome. Hermaphroditism or your true hermaphroditism will be a rare condition wherein you have both the ovaries and the testes. Okay, so your pseudohermaphroditism, um, genetic males with feminized external genitalia most commonly manifest with hypospadias or wherein the urethral opening is found on the ventral surface of the penis. Or genetic females that have virilized genitalia will present with clitoral hypertrophy. So these are very, very important things that you should take note of. Now, you also need to um, take note of your congenital adrenal hyperplasia as a probable cause, your 5-alpha hydroxy, high-5-alpha reductase deficiency you know, as prob uh, probabilities of uh, disorders of sexual dysfunction. With menstrual cycle physiology, Again, it's very important that you take note of the average duration of the menstrual cycle. Now, the average duration in a regular menstrual cycle is 28 days with um, the uh, plus minus seven days with the average duration of at least four days with a 
amount of menstrual blood loss of less than 60 ml per day. So if there's any abnormality within this, it could either be um, increased bleeding or oligomenorrhea or decreased bleeding. So it's very important that you take note of establish what is normal for that patient. And then know what is the physiology behind the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle can be divided into the ovarian phase, which is the development of the follicle, and the uterine phase, psych, um, part of the cycle, of the menstrual cycle, which actually prepares the endometrium for possible delivery and a possible uh, implantation of a fetus. Now, so that the main goal of the normal of the menstrual cycle is to produce at least one egg per cycle, no, at least one mature egg per cycle, so that the ovarian cycle can be divided into a follicular phase, the ovulation phase, and the luteal phase. And the uterine cycle can be divided into your proliferative, the ovulation, and the secretory phase. What is important to take note of is if we're going to um, establish the normal pattern of the cycle, there are differences between the hormones at the different parts of the cycle. But usually the follicular and the proliferative phase of both ovarian and uterine cycle will coincide and the luteal and the secretory phase will coincide. So that if... Um, so on day one of the menses, wherein there is bleeding, now what happens there, that's your menstrual phase, the patient bled because of the decrease in the LH, FSH, estrogen, and progesterone because of the death of the corpus luteum. Okay, so that will be the menstrual phase. After that, there it will send a feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary causing an increase in your FSH and LH. Okay, so it will cause an increase in your FSH and LH, causing um, follicular development, okay, so recruitment of the follicles and proliferation of the endometrium. So the endometrium will recruit more endometrial glands until such a time that the FSH, the LH will overtake the increase in the FSH and the estrogen. And that, that, that overtake of the LH or the LH surge will be um, important for ovulation to happen. Because once there's LH surge, there will be this way, decidualization of the granulosa cells. So instead of form, uh, forming your estrogen, it will now um, produce your progesterone. So that after ovulation, there will be release of the follicles, there will be increase in progesterone, that so that the corpus luteum will be maintained during that time. So there will be a steady supply of your progesterone. If there will be pregnancy, then that corpus luteum will be prolonged by the action of the beta-HCG if ever there is fertilization. But if there's no fertilization, the corpus luteum will die. Okay. In the endometrium, on the other hand, what happens is during the, the later part, no, during the luteal or the secretory phase in the endometrium, aside from the fact that the, the endometrial glands are a, a lot in amount because of the proliferation, they will also start to be um, functional or there will be a lot of glycogen during that phase so that the endometrial glands will appear tortuous. Okay, so they will appear tortuous and they will appear secretory for at least 12 to 14 weeks. After that, if the patient does not have fertilization to happen, the corpus luteum will die, again, decrease in your LSFSH and cause the menstruation. No? So the menstrual blood or the menses will only stop after the proliferation of the endometrium, again, brought about by the increase in your FSH. In our LH. Okay. So that's it. Okay. So the cyclic changes, your decidua functionalis is the one that will proliferate and ultimately shed off. Okay. Ultimately shed off during the uh, cycle if pregnancy doesn't occur. But the basalis does not undergo significant monthly proliferation. So it's the one that regenerates after each menses. So that there are definitions of your menstrual cycle irregularities. Again, we actually shy away from this, all of these definitions. What I want you to remember is just heavy menstrual bleeding 
if there's increased bleeding, you don't need to know what menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, menometrorrhagia means. You just need to differentiate the heavy menstrual bleeding and the timing of bleeding. When does it occur? Does it occur in between menses? Or does the patient have irregularly timed cycles in frequent menstrual interval, in the other words? And for a diagnosis of abnormal uterine bleeding, okay, you have your structural, hormonal, malignancy, and bleeding disorders. In other words, you have to remember your palm coin. No? Palm coin. The first part, the palm part, will actually be more of the anatomical part. So your polyps, your adenomyosis, your leiomyomas, and malignancies. And then the coin part will be on the physiologic part. So your coagulation of problems, your ovulatory dysfunction, okay, endometrial pathology, not necessarily anatomical, meaning maybe an infection, okay, iatrogenic or not otherwise specified will be included in your differential diagnosis. For, so for working up patients that have abnormal uterine bleeding, you have to ask in your history about the timing of the bleeding, when that's it happened, the quantity of the bleeding, the menstrual history, okay, menarche, when does it happen, the recent periods, the last normal menses and the previous menses, the associated symptoms during the bleeding episode, was there pain? Did you take any medications? And then associated uh, family history of bleeding disorders. On physical exam, you need to take note of uh, organs in the reproductive tract that could be possible sources of the bleeding, like the cervix or the vaginal mucosa. Um, take note of the size of the uterus, presence of fibroids. Assess for presence of hirsutism or thyroid disease, like your um, <clears throat> thinning of the skin or dry skin, or even your um, exophthalmos in Graves' disease, or signs of hyperprolactinemia, okay, or visual field testing abnormalities. You can also do your pap smear and endometrial biopsy if appropriate. Always, always do a pregnancy test, especially in the reproductive age, because abnormalities or accidents of pregnancy can all, always present as bleeding or amenorrhea. So it's always important in the reproductive age, even if they, what do you call this, even if they, deny sexual contact, do pregnancy test. And then you could do your imaging, your transvaginal ultrasound, and then your sonoisterogram or your stereosalpingogram to evaluate for the fallopian tubes and ovaries. And you could do your hysteroscopy or your DNC afterwards. So for bleeding, okay? So if it's the, mo the most common cause of vaginal bleeding in childhood will be still foreign body in the vagina. So if the patient is presenting with vaginal bleeding and she's a child, no, don't always think of, of course, you have at the back of your mind, think of a probable abuse, but the most common still will be the foreign body found in the vagina. And while in the reproductive age, the most common cause of vaginal bleeding will be accidents of pregnancy. And the most common cause of vaginal bleeding in the postmenopausal women will still be your atrophic endometrium. So a very, very thinned out endometrium can be a cause of vaginal bleeding. So that if you're going to treat patients, of course, know the cause of the bleeding. So for example, you have your polyps. What is your treatment for a polyp causing the bleeding? Then it's surgery. You could do your curettage or do your polypectomy or your hysteroscopic polypectomy, okay? If it's um, ovulatory dysfunction, then you could just regulate the menses with the pills, your OCPs, okay? If it's a because of a myoma or adenomyosis, it depends on whether or not the patient is young and desirous of pregnancy. If the patient is young, then you could give her um, progesterone, okay? If she's not desirous of pregnancy and she's bleeding, Profusely, you could um, tell her to have a hysterectomy done already. So again, it depends on the indication or for, for the cause of the bleeding. But your main goal, you know, if you have abnormal uterine bleeding, is to stop the bleeding acutely so that you could have time to um, evaluate the patient for probable causes of the bleeding. 
No, so usually we give them your antifibrinolytics, your tranexamic acid, and your mefenamic acid. You could also give them your estrogens, high-dose estrogen, high-dose progesterone. All of these will work, but the most efficient or the most effective will be your high-dose estrogen, your progesterone. Okay. So amenorrhea, on the other hand, may be... Um, pathologic or physiologic okay it may be physiologic like in pregnancy no there's physiologic amenorrhea or postpartum when there's lactational amenorrhea pathologic there could be secondary causes so if we're talking about amenorrhea that is primary meaning the patient never had had menses before so you have to take into consideration whether the breast and the uterus are present so this is where your secondary sexual characteristics will come into play. Like we said earlier, when the breast is present but the uterus is absent, you have two conditions that you have to take note of, whether there's testicular feminization or androgen sensitivity or your congenital absence of the uterus or your mullerian agenesis. It's the same. When the breast is absent and the uterus is present, you take note of any pituitary mass in your Turner syndrome. If the breast is absent, the uterus is absent. Um, uh, what, what, um, what, um, diagnose them with probable agonadism. So you do your karyotyping. If both are present, the breast and the uterus are present, then you have to rule out hypothalamic, pituitary, and ovarian causes of the amenorrhea. Again, no prime, this is primary amenorrhea, meaning the patient never had menses before. So primary amenorrhea should be um, worked up in patients who have breast development but without menses after two years after the breast development or there is no menses after 15 years old. Okay, Your secondary amenorrhea, on the other hand, will be seen in patients who have had menses before, but all of a sudden had no menses. So it could include um, intrauterine adhesions or Asherman syndrome after acute touch, but you have to work up for hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian, or uterine or outflow tract problems. No? So the most common cause of amenorrhea in adolescents will still be anorexia nervosa. The most common cause of primary amenorrhea is still gonadal failure. And you test gonadal failure by testing your serum FSH. If it's very, very high, then most probably you have gonadal failure. Okay. So that's for amenorrhea. So for pediatric gynecology, the most common problem will still be your vulvovaginitis. Okay, so in you have to take note if you're going to palpate the or pelvic organs in the child, they are usually not palpable. Okay, the cervix, if you're going to palpate it, is in a two is to one um, ratio with the size. No? So the cervix in children is larger than that of the uterus as compared to a woman in the reproductive age, the uterus is larger than the cervix, it's one is to two. Vaginal infections like your trichomoniasis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia will suggest sexual molestation. And there's usually a physiologic discharge six to 12 months before menarche due to increasing estrogen levels. No? So you also have to take note of if you're dealing with congenital abnormalities, take note of any history of dietyl still bestrol exposure because this will you these are the things that you are going to see now you could see vaginal adenosis in one third of the patients you can see cervical vaginal rages in one fourth and most will heal spontaneously and there's also an increased case of clear cell carcinoma of the cell in the cervix as we said earlier if there is bloody and false smelling discharge in children the most common still will be foreign body and treatment is usually done of course by removing the foreign body under general anesthesia with or without initiation of antibiotics. No? Genital trauma is usually uh, because of straddle injury or accidental fall and it's also important to take note of onset of precocious puberty okay, which refers to sexual maturation before 18. 
factors of age. So precocious puberty, if you remember how puberty will develop, now there will usually be your breast development. That's the first one. Then there will be an increase in the height and then your hair in the axillary and pubic area and then your menses. No? So you don't wait for menses to happen before you diagnose precocious puberty. If you already see um, development of the breast or a sudden increase in the height of the child more than the age of more than her age, you should always rule out precocious puberty because once menstruation happens, no, the child will not grow um, tall anymore. Diba? One of the, the main effects of your estrogen is closure of the epiphyseal plates. No? So you have to stop precocious puberty as early as possible. So it's a biological transition. Growth spurt occurs earlier in girls. And it's always important that telarchy precedes menarche. So this is how the growth velocity will be seen in girls. As with the boys, again, they are they go taller at an earlier stage as compared to your boys. And the, the also important will be the mean age at when you are going to see the de uh, development of the puberty or the secondary sexual characteristic that breast, the appearance of pubic hair and menarche. Always take note of that. So that the hormonal control of puberty will be very, very important. So if you have signs of precocious puberty, you have to determine the basal gonadotropins. Your high levels of LH could be a, brought about by a gonadotropin-producing myoplasm or a choriocarcinoma. Low levels of gonadotropins, you have to assess your testosterone and estrogen levels. Increased estradiol levels can be caused by myoplasms producing your estrogen. If there's high androgen levels, you have to assess whether there's an androgen-producing myoplasm of the ovary or even the adrenal glands. So it's very important. You also take note of the thyroid function test of that child and the bone age assessment. Okay, so your precocious puberty, these are the following um, causes. And then your precocious puberty of peripheral origin will be coming from tumors, functional tumors of the ovary or the adrenals. Okay. So without therapy, 50% will not reach the height of at least five feet, okay? So pseudoprecocious puberty is due to usually your um, functioning ovarian tumors, mostly your granulosa cell tumors. So the most common cause of your GNRH independent precocious puberty will be a functioning ovarian tumor, primarily your granulosa cell tumor, which causes abnormal bleeding. And the first sign of puberty will be your breast budding or thalarchy. And the latest sign will be your menarche. Again, very important to take note of. Any questions so far? Do you have any questions? Any questions? None. So if you have no questions, we'll go with the gynecologic infections. So... Um, Bartholin's abscess, as we've said, is found at the 4 and 8 o'clock position of your right hand. Four and eight o'clock position of the vulva. They are the most common largest of the vulva and it's usually because of an infection. They are initially managed by marsopialization, but if it's a recurrent enlargement and the patient is more than 40 years of age, we usually excise the entire mass for biopsy so as to rule out the probability of a malignancy. Another that you have to take note of will be your condyloma acuminata or your genital warts. It's the most common sexually transmitted infection. Um, it's transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact and it's highly contagious at 24 to 65%. It's usually caused by your HPV 6 and 11, and biopsy of the lesion will show the characteristic appearance of your coilocytes or the vacuolated keratinocytes with perinuclear halo of your HPV infection. So treatment will be cryotherapy, um, laser excision, trichloroacetic acid, and imiquimod cream. 
Now, the STDs of concern will go through the sores and the drips, okay? So, the sores or the ulcers will be uh, syphilis. Most commonly seen will be the syphilis and your genital herpes. And others will be your lymphogranuloma venerium, cancroid, and your granuloma uh, inguinale, which is not common. And then the drips or the discharges will be your gonorrhea, chlamydia, your non-gonococcal urethritis, your trichomonas vaginitis, and your candidiasis. Okay, so the source, syphilis, and genital herpes, uh, the one that is painful will be your genital herpes simplex and your chancroid, okay? So if it's a painful ulcer, it could either be herpes or chancroid. If it's painless, it will be either your syphilis, your lymphogranuloma venerium, and your granuloma inguinale. Okay, so syphilis is caused by a spirochete, your treponema pallidum. Primary syphilis occurs three weeks after the inoculation, and the primary infection will occur, um, be a painless chancre, which is a single clean-based ulcer usually seen on the labia and the vaginal wall, and it might cause your painful lymphadenopathy. Okay, so that's your primary. So since it's a painless lesion, it will usually not be diagnosed. Okay, your secondary syphilis is systemic disease resulting from hematogenous dissemination, usually six to eight weeks after the primary infection, and they will usually present with rashes over at the palms and the soles. So you have your characteristic maculopapular rash, you have your condyloma latum of your secondary syphilis, which produces your moist grayish papules or warts. You can have fever, arthraja, and generalized lymphadenopathy. Your tertiary syphilis will occur three to 10 years after the initial infections, and they will present as gomas. Okay, there are granulomatous lesions found in the skin and in the bones. They might also present as cardiovascular syphilis and neurosyphilis. If it's your cardiovascular syphilis, they will present with aortitis or chest pain or aortic aneurysm. Or your neurosyphilis, they might present with general paresis, stabs dorsalis, and your Argyll Robertson pupil. Diagnosis is by dark field microscopy. And screening, however, it's very difficult to do, no? very difficult to isolate your syphilis. Um, your spirochetes. So most often than not for screening, we do our non-specific tests, which are your VDRL and your RPR. If it's positive there, then you do your specific test, your FTA, H, uh, FTA ABS or your MHATP test. No? So the way that we do it, if it's positive with your non-specific, you request for your specific. After giving the treatment, which is benzatine penicillin G as a single dose, Request for your non-specific again, okay? All sexual partners should be treated, okay? Next will be your lymphogranuloma venerium, which is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. It occurs in three stages and involves infection of the lymphatic tissue in the genital region. So they are usually small, painless ulcerations, again, painless, which may develop at stage two, unilateral painful inguinal lymphadenopathy or your buboes or your matted lymph nodes that adhere to the underlying skin. If you are not able to capture it still at that time, that bubo will rupture and cause strictures in fistulas in the anogenital tract, okay? So the diagnosis of your lymphogranuloma venerium will be complement fixation, your serologic test, your PCR testing, and a culture of your genital or lymph node specimen. Treatment will be by doxycycline for 21 days twice a day. All partners should also be treated. Your granuloma inguinale, on the other hand, or your donovanosis, is caused by your Klebsiella granulomatis. Okay, they are large, painless, spreading ulcers in the vulvar area with friable bases. No? The margins are bleed easily and they are usually beefy red in appearance. Okay, so the beefy red is very important. 
inguinal lymph adenopathy is rare as compared to your um, lymphagranuloma. The typical feature will be the safety pin appearance or the presence of your Donovan bodies under right or gym sustain. Treatment will be the same as your lymphogranuloma venerium. It's doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for 10, 21 days. Okay. So for the painful lesions, you have your genital herpes and chancroid. So your genital herpes usually present as um, vesicles first that will ulcerate and crust. And the vesicles usually are grouped and uniform in size, usually found in the vulva, perineum, and perianal area. They might present with fever, malay, and bilateral inguinal lymphadenopathy. Diagnosis is by uh, serology, a PCR, and your chunk smear. Treatment of your herpes simplex is through oral acyclovir per 100 milligrams three times a day or 200 milligrams five times a day. And all partners should be evaluated. Okay, so that's for your genital herpes. Your chancroid is caused by Haemophilus docreyi. They cause extremely painful ulcers around the perilabial area. And they are associated with unilateral, suppurative, painful inguinal lymph nodes. Okay, your systemic symptoms may not be present. So diagnosis is culture of your hemophilus de Cray and Graham stain will find your school of fish appearance under the microscopy. But it's difficult to see the school of fish, so usually we do you our PCR testing. Treatment will be by giving your azithromycin one gram single dose or ceftriaxone 250 milligrams in a single dose. Okay, so next will be the drips. Again, it's very important that you take note that if the patient is um, uh, complaining of this, of course, sexually transmitted infections or sexually related infections, please um, also evaluate for the presence of HIV, especially if the attacks are becoming more recurrent or becoming more severe despite the appropriate treatment for your patients, okay? So for um, the drips or the increase in the vaginal discharge, we should take note of the normal vaginal secretions first, okay? So um, they, if your normal vaginal secretion is common, especially in its physiologic that there is increased secretion in pregnant women or those who have are taking your progesterone only pill. So you have to take note that even if there's increase in vaginal discharge, as long as there are no associated subjective symptoms of pain or erythema or pruritus, it is usually normal and there's no unusual odor. Okay, so that the symptoms of the different diseases or that causes discharge will differ depending on what is the cause of that infection. Usually, if you have an uh, infection caused by your chlamydia trachomatis, it's usually a subclinical infection. It's usually just mucoid discharge that might be normal. So your chlamydia trachomatis rarely cause um, increase in vaginal discharge. Whereas your gonorrhea will cause a purulent endocervical discharge. So what is purulent? So sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate it. The normal discharge of females will be whitish discharge. Now, purulent is you get a, a sample of the discharge from the cervix. Take a look at it against, uh, the, you place it on the swab and then take it outside. If it's a little bit yellowish, then you have cervicitis that could either be gonorrhea or chlamydia. Trichomonas, on the other hand, will usually cause a malodorous, purulent, frothy vaginal discharge with a strawberry cervix. So the cervix will have punctate appearance on top of it, no? not the pink, smooth appearance that we usually see. Okay, Your bacterial vaginosis will have fishy odor and will usually be a basic in pH. The candidiasis is the characteristic cottage cheese-like discharge and occurrence. Okay. Are usually associated with intense pruritus, okay, or pain. So these are the different diagnostic tests for chlamydia. 
you could do your PCR, DNA probe, or your nucleic acid amplification test. For gonorrhea, your culture and your PCR also, your nucleic acid amplification test. For trichomonas, a simple wet mount of the discharge will you'll be able to see the trichomonads over at, at light microscopy. In bacterial vaginosis, there will be an increased number of your clue cells, which is your clue cells are actually just the epithelial cells of the cervix with increase in your WBC. Okay, the candida, candida can also be diagnosed by your wet prep or your wet mount with addition of KOH, wherein you are going to see your sudi hyphae or body yeast. A treatment will be dependent on the cause. Your chlamydia will be azithromycin or doxycycline. Your gonorrhea, uh, we uh, give your ceftriaxone already. We don't give your afloxacin on already because there's increased incidence of resistance to your afloxacin. Your trichomonas can be given metronidazole, bacterial vaginosis, metronidazole, or clindamycin, and candidiasis will be your antifungals, primarily your fluconazoles, and your topical antifungals if it affects the different parts of the vulva. Okay, so we'll have a short break first, and then we'll come back after five minutes, okay? Short break first, I'll come back after five minutes.
so I'm going to start again. So for we're now going to deal with the upper genital tract infections, primarily your pelvic inflammatory diseases. The pelvic inflammatory diseases is usually the term that we use for inflammatory disease of the upper genital tract that is not related to pregnancy. Okay, so it's commonly caused by your Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, Neisseria gonorrhea and uh, your Chlamydia trachomatis. Um, the minimum criteria will be that there should be um, uterine or adnexal tenderness or cervical motion tenderness as evidenced by your wiggling tenderness during your physical exam, okay? So additional criteria would be a fever of more than 38.3, abnormal cervical or vaginal mucopurulent discharge, again, mucopurulent meaning yellowish in appearance, increased number of WBC on microscopy of your vaginal secretions, elevated ESR, elevated CRP, and documentation of infection with Neisseria gonorrhea or Chlamydia trachomatis. Um, you can diagnose it more specifically if the patient has endometrial biopsy showing endometritis, TVS showing um, or MRI finding showing tubo ovarian abscess or complex, and laparoscopic abnormalities associated with PID. So, Hospitalization is usually um, indicated if the patients will have um, in, uh, instances wherein surgical emergencies cannot be excluded, like in patients who have pain in the right lower quadrant and you can't entirely rule out appendicitis on top of a probable PID. When the patient is pregnant, there is no clinical response to antimicrobial therapy, Unable to tolerate outpatient treatment regimen if there's severe illness, nausea, or vomiting, and the presence of your tubo ovarian abscess. So these are the different regimens for your PID. You could have regimen A or regimen B, cefotetan or cefoxetine plus doxycycline, or your clindamycin and gentamicin. Um, every eight hours. So it's very important that you take note that these are the parenteral regimens that are recommended. But if you have tubo ovarian abscess on ultrasound or MRI, it will be more prudent for you to choose regimen B or your clindamycin and gentamicin. It's better absorbed by the abscess. Okay. If ever there are um, allergies, you could also give your patient your ampicillin sulbactam and or your with doxycycline every 12 hours. For oral treatment, you have to give your ceftriaxone IM plus your doxycycline twice a day for 14 days with or without metronidazole plus or your cefoxetine IM dose plus doxycycline with or without metronidazole. So, um, Gonorrhea and chlamydia can coexist in one patient 25 to 50% of the time. And they will usually develop acute salpingitis in 15% of women. So infertility will be increased um, um, with each episode of increasing PID at 10 to 25% with the second episode and 40 to 60% with the third episode. So it's very, very high. There is a syndrome that you need to know, know that is associated with PID. It happens in 5 to 10% of patients wherein there is associated perihepatic inflammation, okay, in 5 to 10% of patients with PID. The most common cause of non-viral sexually transmitted disease is your chlamydia trachomatis. It's actually more common than your neisseria. And these patients, you know, as we said, your cervicitis caused by chlamydia will actually have no discharge. So the patient might be asymptomatic and then they will present already with the chronic sequelae of PID, which is your pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, infertility, and even your ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so it's very important. So your benign gynecologic lesions, primarily your ovarian lesions, it's very important that you take the note of the age of that woman. 
or of the, the child or of that woman and con uh, correlated with what is the most commonly um, seen mass in that age group like in the children no functional system to still be common in the benign group but if it's you could also see your germ cell tumors like your dermoid cyst in the adolescents it could still be your functional cyst your dermoid cyst or it could be either your pregnancy if there is an ovarian tumor there's also an increased incidence of your epithelial ovarian tumors but that the germ cell tumors are more predominant at this time for the reproductive age still your functional cyst will be the highest, followed by your pregnancy, uterine fibroids, and your epithelial ovarian tumors. In the perimenopausal, it's more of the fibroids and your ovarian tumors that are the most common pelvic masses at this age group. Also, your functional ovarian cysts are the most common among the three, you know, the, the children, the adolescent, and the reproductive age. They are anatomic variations resulting from normal ovarian function so remember if that mass is already more than three centimeters it is defined as a cyst already no so you could have your follicular cyst your corpus luteum cyst or your thick lutein cyst if you remember no how are you going to differentiate between the three if it's physiologic functional cyst it will usually disappear okay during the proliferative phase Okay, because your corpus luteum usually at the last part only, at the last portion. Your theca lutein is also related with increased amounts of your beta HCG as what is seen in patients who have more, um, gestational trophoblastic disease or your molar pregnancies. Okay, expectant management is the treatment of choice unless there is severe pain or a suspicion of malignancy or complication like rupture or torsion of the mass. That's the only time you operate on these patients. But without that, expect that management, meaning you just repeat the ultrasound after two cycles, usually on day five to seven of the cycle. Another um, functional cyst that's common will be your corpus luteum cyst. They arise, arise from hemorrhage of the mature corpus luteum that can undergo a secondary cystic change. No? So, it could just be uh, physiologic. So you, again, they may vary from asymptomatic masses to something that causes severe bleeding. So again, the treatment is usually um, observation, but if you don't, you can't rule out the probability of intraperitoneal bleeding associated with rupture, then you need to operate on these patients, but they usually resolve on their own, okay? Halban syndrome is a very important term that you need to remember. It's a term that we use for persistently functioning corpus luteum, wherein it usually uh, similar to an unruptured ectopic pregnancy. There's delay in the normal period, there's unilateral pelvic pain, and a small tender adnexal mass. Management is conservative or by surgery. Usually we do it we do cystectomy, so very, very conservative or cystectomy, just remove the cyst. Follicular cyst, um, most frequent cystic structures, they are asymptomatic most often and they may be associated with hypogastric pain and discomfort, so just give them drugs for that. And then TBS, you differentiate it from a simple and a complex cyst. The majority will disappear spontaneously and um, there's sometimes it happens silent rupture four to eight, but it will just be reabsorbed. So you just monitor your patient. Thicalutein cyst is because of increase in your exogenous gonadotropins. The thicker thicker layer undergoes mark um, luteinization, so they are almost always bilateral and causes small, moderate to massive enlargement of the ovaries. So for thickal cysts, it's usually associated with amenorrhea. Some may also have bleeding. Some will have pain and associated with molar pregnancies, choriocarcinomas, conditions associated with large placentas and intake of ovulation-inducing agents. No? conservative management because the moment you treat the associated manifestation, it will go back to its original appearance. The ovaries will go back to its 
normal appearance. So for benign ovarian lesions, benign ovarian teratomas comprise 15 to 25% of masses and they are usually the most common to be seen in adolescents. Fibromas, however, are the most common benign solid ovarian tumor. Okay, they are usually um, confused with a myoma. No, so fibromas may appear like myomas on ultrasound specifically, especially the pedunculated ones. Okay, ascites may be associated with them. The size is more than six centimeters, and this is where you actually see your MEIG syndrome, M E I G S, wherein you have ascites, your pleural effusion, but you don't need to do um, what do you call that to do parasynthesis or thoracentesis. Now, it will usually resolve upon removal of the fibroma. It's benign also. Brenner tumors are uh, smooth epithelial tumors that usually seen in 40 to 60 years of age, and they are usually unilateral. So these are the common epithelial tumors. You have your serous, mucinous, endometrioid, clear cell, which is associated with diethyl silvestrol, and your undifferentiated carcinomas. Again, more frequent will be your serous, and they are more associated with enlarged um, bilaterality. Your mucinous, they grow very, very big. So they grow very large. Your endometrioid, um, endometrial cyst will usually be benign, but they are um, associated with dysmenorrhea and infertility. So these are your different germ cell tumors, your dysgerminoma, most common. And they are usually bilateral. Your teratomas are also common. Your mature dermoid cyst and associated also with, um, what do you call this? Your mature teratomas um, associated with bilaterality also. Okay. So serous cyst adenomas are bilateral in 12 to 20 percent. They are and they are most often unilateral. No, so they are contain clear colorless, thin liquid, and they may have small papillae, so very, very small papillae. So they will have um, lining that is abundant since it's an epithelial tumor, so you need to look at the epithelial lining of the mass. No? So they have columnar epithelium that is not stratified. No? So they don't also have a large amount of mitotic figures. The symptoms usually will be pressure manifestations, and they are cured by surgical removal of the cyst or cystectomy or phorocystectomy. Your mucinous tumors are epithelial tumors that are filled with mucin. So they look like endocervical cells or your intestinal cells, which have um, a baseline, the basal, uh, the nucleus is oriented basally. They are mostly benign and they are very, very large tumors. No? So they occur in the third to fifth decades of life, bilateral in 2 to 3%, and they beca can become gigantic tumors. The possible complications will be perforation and rupture, and if they perforate, they might cause the deposition of mucin into the peritoneal cavity, causing your pseudomyxoma peritonei. So this is the appearance. They are usually unilocular with clear, slimy fluid. Okay, again, basally oriented nuclei, again, you, just one layer, okay? They resemble the goblet cells of the bowels. So the most common adnexal mass in the woman of the reproductive age is still your follicular cyst of the ovary. The most common benign neoplastic tumor of the ovary in the reproductive age is the serosis adenoma. In the adolescents, it's usually your benign cystic teratoma or your dermoid. The most common benign neoplasms in the ovary at the age 20 to 44 will be the following, your dermoid, your serous, and your mucinosis adenoma. Most common malignant tumor in all age group will be your serous adenocarcinoma. Most common solid adnexal tumor in young women will be your dysgerminoma, which is a germ cell tumor, and your benign cystic teratoma. Most common adult tumor, um, abdominal tumor in childhood will be your Wilms tumor. So it's very, very important that you take note of this. So this PowerPoint already mentioned what is the most common at the particular age group. So please remember that.
So the age again, no, if you have abnormal uterine bleeding in a particular age group. Okay, please take note again of the most common causes. But in the reproductive age, no, please always rule out pregnancy. And in the postmenopausal stage, if you're talking about endometrial lesions, the most common still will be a thinned out endometrium or your atrophic vag um, vaginitis. Okay, so for the ones that causes your bleeding, your polyps, they are usually small pedunculated neoplasms of the connective tissue. They usually present with intermenstrual bleeding or your postcoital bleeding or discharge. Okay, so they are usually treated by a polypectomy, especially if you could see it in the, in the speculum exam and the pedicle can easily be seen. No? So your uterine leomyomas are the most common benign to more of the smooth muscle cells of the uterus. No? So they are found in 20 to 30% of the reproductive age woman and they are usually related to estrogen stimulation. So as you could see in the picture, there are different types of myoma. So you have the purely muscular within the muscle, your intramural myomas. Then you have your sub myomas, which will um, grow to the serosa layer of the, of the uterus. And then you have your pedunculated myoma, which grows on top of that serosa layer. And then you have your submucosal myomas, which causes the bleeding no, most commonly. And you have cervical myomas. These are very rare because as the, as the term implies, they are muscles, smooth tumors of the smooth muscle cell. And you know that the cervix is mostly, mostly made up of fibrous tissue. So cervical myomas are very rare, but they can still be seen. Okay, so not all leomyomas will cause bleeding. The most common that the most common type of myoma that causes bleeding will be your submucosal, predominantly because of the location seen in the picture. It's located within the endometrial cavity, so it increases the surface area of that um, endometrial cavity, causing the bleeding. Another um, cause of bleeding will be your endometrial polyp, benign tumor of the endometrium. It's a hyperplastic overgrowth of endometrial glands project, projecting into the endometrium. These are polyps. This one, this, this, this. No. So they usually present with irregular ble heavy bleeding. And the treatment, the gold standard, will be hysteroscopic resection of that polyp. Or you could give your GNRH agonist. Another benign tumor that causes endometria, I bleed, the abnormal uterine bleeding will be adenomyosis. So in adenomyosis, there is ectopic endometrial glands and stroma within the myometrium. So it's adenomyosis within the uterine musculature as compared to endometriosis wherein the ectopic endometrial glands are found outside the uterus. It could be in the rectum, it could be in the ovary, it could be in the tubes. No, so adenomyosis is within the endometria, within the myometrium. So they present with an enlarged uterus that is globularly enlarged no, as compared to the myoma. When you palpate it, it's nodularly enlarged. And adenomyosis, it's globularly enlarged. Treatment, definitive treatment is adenomyosis. But if the patient wants to have pregnancy, then you could opt for medical treatment. That's what we said. No, you could give your OCPs to control the bleeding, either your progesterone or your combined oral contraceptive pills. Okay, that's for adenomyosis. Infertility, okay, is the inability to reproduce after 12 months of unprotected intercourse. No? So 50% of fertile couples will conceive within three months, then 75 in six months, 90% by 12 months. So in other words, infertility should be inability to conceive within one year of regularly trying to have to, to get caught, to get pregnant. No? So infertility is not diagnosed if the patient doesn't have pregnancy, if they don't really actively attempt on having a sexual contact to produce a pregnancy. For example, the, the husband is over overseas, no? they don't have regular sexual contacts, you don't have infertility with that, you don't have the pregnancy because there's no regular contact. 
no so the causes of infertility majority still will be an ovulation next will be your male factor followed by tubal and explained endometriosis and the other factors so it's very important here no there's a lot of um the male factor of infertility will um, cause a lot of cases no so that and that's the only thing that's the first um what do you call this diagnostic that the that the husband will only do so you do semen analysis before you analyze that woman because once you start with a woman and then lo and behold you found that there's low sperm count then you just wasted a lot of time so check the male first with the semen analysis and then also subsequently check the female with the factor of an, an ovulation so the primary test that you're going to use is the documentation of ovulation by history you could just ask this no usually the ovulation your your um can be de detected by doing your history but there's usually your mid cycle search so there's usually pain in mid cycle that could document ovulation or finding of a premenstrual syndrome it's usually documents also your ovulation or if you want to be more um, scientific about it you could check for the lh surge which you could readily test with an over-the-counter kit of your lh surge it's available in the pharmacies now another test of course will be your semen analysis and then your hysterosalpingogram which will um your hysterosalpingogram will detect if there is uh, the fallopian tubes are patent and your diagnostic laparoscopy if everything seems fine and there's still you can't find anything that's causing the infertility okay so you could also check for the following your prolactin your tsh um, endometrial biopsy sperm antibodies bacterial culture no even your bbt so for semen analysis the normal values are what you see here on the slide with a pink background and the different terms that we use what is important here will be the finding of normal morphology with progressive motility okay that's the one that will be very important for us no? not just the count but the, the presence of normal morphology and the presence of motile sperms okay so of all the cases of infertility and ovulation, the cause of the infertility is the one that is of the greatest success that you could treat because it can easily be treated by your ovulation inducing drugs like your clomiphene citrate, your letrozole, again, depending on what is the main cause of the anovulation. You could also give your human menopausal gonadotropin or your GNRH, your gonadotropins. Again, it will depend on what is the cause in your patients. No? For um, artificial insemination, if ever you tried your clomiphene or if the, de the defect is because of a tubal factor, you have hydrosalpinges, no? the, the best factor for the patient is for artificial insemination. The motility of the sperm should be very, very important. No? So... Endometriosis, on the other hand, is associated with infertility in 60 to 70 percent, but mild cases could still get pregnant. Okay, so these are the different in vitro techniques, your IVF in the laboratory, your GIFT, gamete intrafallopian tube transfer, or your zygote intrafallopian tube transfer. Okay, what is important to take note of is there are causes of infertility that um, like your PCOS, no? PCOS is a very common cause of infertility. Um, the usual first line now that we give will be your letrozole. It's not your clomiphene citrate anymore because your clomiphene citrate has anti-estrogen effects. So the problem that we have with your clomiphene citrate is there's thinning of the endometrium as compared to your letrozole. Okay? So that's it for menopause, no? So bear with me, just a few more slides. Can you see the slides? Yes, please. 
Okay. So for menopause, you're already familiar with the dwarfs of menopause. No? So um, it's very important that you take note that most women will actually stay in menopause for a longer period of time as compared to the reproductive cycle. And there are different types of menopause, the natural menopause and surgical menopause. Okay, so it's very, very important that you understand that there are different stages of menopause which encompasses the climacteric period and the different types, your natural and your induced menopause. So your natural menopause will be established by gradual cessation of menses over a 12-month period. Usually starts at 45 to 50, the average age is 51. If it occurs before 40, then you have a premature menopause or your premature ovarian insufficiency or premature ovarian failure. If you have induced menopause, these are patients who underwent um, an operation, not thereby removing their ovaries or um, radiation that affected the ovaries or chemotherapy that decreased the amount of follicles. No? So the usual sequence of events for menopause will be there will usually be a decrease in inhibin production by the ovary followed by a decrease in estradiol blood levels and an increase in your FSH and LH during the initial part. So it will be very important to take note that during the climacteric period, the bleeding may be irregular and acyclic in women who are in the perimenopausal period, okay? So what is normal supposed to be is for the woman to have increasing interval of the menses and decreasing in the flow of the blood. If there's an increase in the duration of the flow or increase in the amount, then that's always abnormal, okay? So as you could see here, this is the straw stage um, system we're in. You could see that during the late reproductive phase, there's subtle changes in the flow length and um, size. Your FSH here will be variable. If you are in the menopausal transition, early menopausal transition, see your FSH is increased. Your AMH is already low at this point in time. So your AMH is actually a good parameter of um, trying to see because if it's already low, more or less that patient will have menopause within four to five years time. So your AMH is a sign of follicular reserve. Okay, so you actually test that also for infertility for women who are more older than 35 years old. So that at the late menopausal transition or perimenopause, you see that your FSH is increased gradually. And you will see here that in the late perimenopausal period, your vasomotor symptoms are likely to happen also. See, you know, there's a variable change in length on the menstrual cycle. Okay, so there's a seven-day difference, so it gradually increasing in interval up to months in the late perimenopausal stage. So it does, it, nothing says here that uh, uh, an increase in the length will also mean an increase in flow. No, so it contradicts, if you have an increase in interval, there should be also be a decrease in the amount of bleeding because you have lesser amount of the hormones. So if there's anything, any problem with that of the, especially in the perimenopausal stage, you have to always um, investigate, not always say that it's because of the menopause. Okay, so estrogen affects a lot of target organs that you see here, so that most of the consequences of menopause to advanced age is because of estrogen deficiency and estrogen withdrawal. So this is what you're going to see. No, so estrogen, so the ones that are caused by estrogen withdrawal will usually resolve with time, like that of hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, palpitations, no, your mood swings, they will usually resolve with time. But if it's caused by estrogen deficiency, like that of your osteoporosis, cognitive decline, increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, it usually worsens with time, okay? So that the pathognomonic sign actually that the patient is having is in the menopausal period already will be your hot flashes. It's sudden onset of heat to the upper body followed by sweating and chills. No? So it's preceded by palpitations and pressure in the head, no? 
in the upper thorax, nose, and face. So it affects 50 to 85 percent of women, and 15 percent of them will find it troubling and interfere with their life. And 20 percent have more than one attacks per day, and it's more common in slim women who smoke. The main etiology is because of a change in the alpha adrenergic mechanisms and your endogenous opioid peptides, meaning the hypothalamic thermoregulatory set point is reset at a lower set point. Okay, so management will be estrogen effectively stops the hot flashes, as we said, because it's caused by estrogen withdrawal. So if it's because of estrogen withdrawal, you give estrogen. You could also give progestins, but it's not as effective as your estrogen. You could also give your clonidine, but it's rarely used, no? or all of this. But the most common thing that we, we say to them is it's natural. So most of them will just give your home remedies or your non-pharmacologic treatment. Vaginal dryness is also another manifestation of menopause. Which, which will cause um, itching and painful intercourse no? caused by declining estrogen levels. No? So treatment will be, because it's just the vagina, you could give your tom topical estrogens, no? either your Premarine or your Ovistin and your um, lubricants, personal lubricants. Urinary issues like incontinence, stress or urge incontinence can be brought about by the declining estrogen levels, but Treatment with estrogen may or may not improve bladder control. So it's not always effective. Remember no, that, there's a, that incontinence is pretty complex. It involves um, anatomical changes. So during the menopausal period, you, you can't actually bring back the normal tautness of the musculature or of that woman. So that's stress incontinence or incontinence for that matter is very difficult to treat. No, in patients. Okay, so skin, um, of course, there'll be loss of skin collagen um, per year, up to 30% are lost. Estrogen improves both the amount and quantity of your collagen. It improves the hydrophilic capacity, but it reduces wrinkles. But if you don't want to give estrogen, you could give your alternatives like your moisturizers and your primrose oil, okay? So it helps in these patients, okay? So osteoporosis, again, the treatment if of osteoporosis is not that effective, but what you could do is prevention of osteoporosis. So give them milk, give them calcium supplements with vitamin D, okay? Exercise. Tibolone is also effective in preventing bone loss, no? So, it decreases your total hip and vertebral factors if you give them your bisphosphonates, your CIRMs, and your, OC, your HRTs. Okay. Cardiovascular disease, you can give your HRT. It has a, a decreased cardioprotective effect if you give them at the correct window of opportunity, meaning at the pre perimenopausal stage. If you give them at a later time, it will not protect against cardiovascular disease. It's actually... Um, it might hurt the patient already, okay? So your HRTs are of different types. There could be estrogen alone because that's the one that's causing most of the manifestation of your patient. Or you could give it as a combined HRT with estrogen and progesterone. If your patient already had an hysterectomy, okay, you could give estrogen alone because you don't need to protect against the effect of estrogen on the uterus. But if you have uh, still, the patient still has uterus, then you give them in the perimenopausal period your cyclical HRT, meaning the same as how you give it in the um, reproductive age for contraception. So it's cyclical. You mimic the normal cycle so that the patient will also still have menses. But in the postmenopausal, you don't need to stop giving. You just give your combined continuous combined. So after one pack is finished, start another pack because you don't need to wait for bleeding to happen. If you have local vaginal or urological manifestations, then use the topical um, preparations. There's also another preparation or patches, patch, 
So it's very uh, important in you could use it for patients who have um, um, episodes of or high risk for thrombosis. Now your patch. So cardio protection by HRT is it lowers your bad cholesterol. No? So it decreases your LDL and your VLDL. It also increases your insulin sensitivity. Okay. So hormone replacement is always an informed choice. The risk and benefits of taking HRT should always be weighed so that your indications, no, these are your usual indications for your HRT, given your HRT. So relief of menopausal symptoms and long-term prevention of osteoporosis and nothing else. So these are the absolute contraindications. You don't give them for patients who have breast cancer, endometrial cancer, venous thromboembolism, acute liver disease. No? So these are the different preparations. And this one, no? I want you to remember Pibolone. This has estrogenic, progestogenic, and androgenic properties. No? So it protects against your vasomotor symptoms of hot flashes. It will also be good for patients who have decreased libido no? because the androgenic properties. And it will protect, especially if the patient has uterus still against the deleterious effect of your estrogen because it has post-progestogenic effects. Your transdermal therapy is the route of choice for patients who have risk factors for venous thromboembolism, liver disease, or your gastrointestinal problems. Those who can't tolerate your HRT. Okay. So this is how you, you choose how what to give. So you see whether you are going to give HRT. Is there an absolute contraindication? If there's no, you have your baseline investigation, then you commence your HRT. If it's with the previous hysterectomy, you could give your estrogen. If there's um, intact uterus with amenorrhea of less than two years, you give your cyclical or sequential SHRT. If there's intact uterus with amenorrhea of more than two years, then you give your combined okay, continuous HRT. Okay. Side effects are the following. So nausea, breast pain, weight gain, menstrual side effects. So these are the risks. What is important to take note of is breast cancer risk is only increased if you give your HRT, excuse me, for more than five years. Okay. In the metral carcinoma, the risk is only increased if you have an opposed estrogen therapy. Okay. So this is how you're going to monitor patients with HRT. Um, again, you monitor their blood pressure, your analysis, you could do your lipid profile and liver function test, and your bone mineral density test. Alternatives, of course, will be your lifestyle changes, no? dietary supplements and drugs. Avoidance of triggers of vasomotor changes, your osteoporosis and exercise. You could give them vitamin E supplementation, vitamin D supplementation, um, adequate intake of calcium, which prevents hip fracture at least 1,000 one five. Okay, so it's not just once a day. You give it three times a day. Or there's a new preparation of calcium supplements wherein you have 1,500 milligrams daily. Okay. So that's it. I one another thing that's very important is for osteoporosis. For you to diagnose osteoporosis, you use the DEXA scan. So you, if you use the DEXA scan, you take the T score of the patient. T score of plus two point five to minus one is normal. Minus one to minus two point five is osteopenic, and less than two point five is osteoporosis. So treatment will be your vitamin D, exercise, your bisphosphonates, your anti-absorption properties, your raloxifen, and your tibolone. Okay? So there you go. These are the um, standard dosages of that uh, dosage of your HRT. Again, no, use the lowest dose possible. That will be 
of benefit for your patients. See here, the ultra low dose may be beneficial, some patients may be not. So in practice, we use the lowest dose first and titrate it up, no, depending on what the patient will usually feel. And these are for control of vasomotor symptoms. Again, you could use your progestins and your t -bolone. Okay. There, you use the standard or the low dose of the patient. This is just to show you the difference between the oral and the transdermal route. See here, no, it significantly lowers down your bad cholesterol, but it has no effect on your um, renin, your thyroid binding properties, and your clotting factors, which is important in, in patients who have history of thrombosis. Okay. That's it. So next. Um, next will be your pelvic organ prolapse. Okay, so pelvic organ prolapse is the protrusion of pelvic organs into the vaginal canal and it results from the lack of support of the pelvic organs. No? So what is important for you to take note of here will be the levator anima cells or the pelvic diaphragm and the endopelvic fascia, the one that supports the main organs. So again, remember your uterus sacral ligaments and your cardinal ligaments. Okay, so when the, your pubocervical fascia actually acts like a hammock, no, so that if it falls, no, if, it, if, if the pubocervical fascia on the anterior part falls, then you will have your cell. If it's the low back end, you will have your uterine or your vault prolapse. No? So that's, we need the factor there. In your risk factors, you have predisposing, inciting, promoting, and decompensating factors, the most important of which will be childbirth. So see there, it just says childbirth. It doesn't say that you have to have a normal vaginal delivery for you to have pelvic organ prolapse. So the patient could still deliver um, via cesarean and still have pelvic organ prolapse. Another that promotes is its obesity. You know, with the advent of um, your epidemic against obesity, there's a lot of patients who have pelvic organ prolapse, as well as conditions that will cause the patient to strain, you know, like constipation or those patients who have COPD because they usually cough, increase in abdominal pressure, so it will cause um, increased incidence of pelvic organ prolapse. And of course, advancing age. You know, so we can't do anything about the advancing age. So that the symptoms usually will be observation or palpation of that mass. You know, the patient felt the mass. Usually, it will be um, self-limiting. So it will be, what we call this, it will resolve on its own. So it regresses. You know, sometimes they can feel it, sometimes it doesn't. No, so there will also be symptoms of urinary uh, symptoms. So you need to ask about um, urinary frequency, incontinence, inability to start or complete a void or bowel symptoms. You have to ask for urgency or incontinence. Also sexual symptoms like dyspareunia or inability to have sexual activity, inability to have orgasm, and sometimes some patients will have pain, no low back pain, perineal pain, or abdominal pressure or pain. So the symptoms will be divided into urinary, sexual, bowel symptoms, and other local symptoms brought about by the appearance of the mass. So if you're going to evaluate them, evaluate them regarding their symptomatic so for the bladder, if you have irritative symptoms, always rule out the possibility of a urinary tract infection first. So you request for urine culture or your, your urinalysis. 
no? So screen for also for bladder stones if you have you see that there is hematuria in the urinalysis by doing your KUB or your pelvic ultrasound. If you have incontinence or avoiding difficulties, you need to do your urodynamic studies, either your office histometry or your post-void residual urine determination. So it's very important. So 15 to 80 percent of women who have developed stress urinary incontinence will actually feel the stress urinary or manifest the stress incontinence when the prolapse or is reduced or when you actually bring the prolapse inside again. No, so urodynamic studies will establish this whether it's a pure stress incontinence or there is overactive bladder or urge incontinence. You need to do your urodynamic studies. Okay. So bowel, how are you going to evaluate patients with bowel problems? You could do, if there's incontinence, you do your endoanal ultrasound. You could request for fecalysis, fecal or hot blood, or even endoscopy. And always evaluate the uh, cervix for pap smear. Remember that the, the cervix is outside, no? the uterus is outside, so it will be subjected to a lot of trauma. So please uh, try to evaluate the, the, the cervix also. Wait. So you also need to evaluate the strength of the pelvic musculature no? by doing your modified Oxford scale. You assess this by doing your internal exam and ask the patient to contract the vagina. So ask them to control. It's like controlling the flow of urine. No? You're asking them to stop the flow of urine midstream. Okay, so you, it, this is entirely subjective. If you feel a good squeeze, then you give it four strong, five, etc. No? You evaluate the pelvic floor by doing the PAPQ or your pelvic prolapse modification system. Okay, so we just take a brief uh, break. Afterwards, we'll discuss the PAPQ system. Okay, so we'll just take a break for a while and we'll come back at 5.05. Okay, let's take a break for a while.
Hello, so I'm back. This will be the last hour of our lecture for summer classes. So just bear with me for a few more slides. Okay. So I'll share my slides again. As we said, no, you have to remember your pop Q, your pelvic organ prolapse quantification staging system, wherein you have different points, your anterior, midline, and posterior compartment. Again, very important to take note so that you will know which part is the most prolapsed portion of the, that entire uh, pelvic floor disorder. No? So it will be very important. So AA... It will be a fixed point, um, 3 cm from the urethral meato, so that if it's minus, remember if it's minus, it's, it's inside the vagina still. If it has a plus, it means it's outside the vagina, so it's outside of the hymen. The hymen is zero, okay? So minus, meaning minus one, minus two, minus three, meaning one cm above the hymen, two cm above the hymen, so three cm above the hymen. So the larger the, the number, if there's a minus sign, the higher it is in the vagina. Whereas if it's a positive number, the higher the number, the more it is prolapsed outside of the vagina. The most prolapsed portion of the anterior vagina is BA. C is the cervix or vaginal cuff. D is the posterior fornix. AP is the counterpart of your AA which is also given minus 3 to plus 3, but now in the posterior vaginal wall. And the BP is the most dependent portion of the posterior fornix of the vagina. So again, this is AA, AA, AP, uh, so AA, BA, sorry, and a, AP and BP. Okay, this is C and this is D. Okay. So your pop -Q quantification system is very important. So your management will be mostly conservative. It's very important that you remember that if you're going to uh, recommend an operation for a patient with pelvic organ prolapse, most of these patients will not have a life-threatening disorder. So you don't need to do your um, surgery. So you could just be symptomatic about it if she's being bothered by the the mass that is protruding from the perineum then just apply the pessary or you do pelvic floor muscle training if you want definitive surgery you could either do uterine sparing surgery or a hysterectomy most often than not we do hysterectomy because this is common in patients who are already menopausal they don't need their uterus anymore so we remove it of course the route is through the vagina because it's already prolapsing Okay, so the pessary is a mechanical device used to support the vagina and other pelvic organs. So it is fitted for a particular woman. So as you could see, you know, there are different types of pessaries, again, depending on what is the patient needs. So the most common will be your donut and your ring pessaries. Okay, so again, it will be fitted for that woman you know, because if, you, if it's bigger than the, what the patient should have, you might have problems with uh, um, constipation or difficulty in urination if it's too big for that woman. No? If it's too small, then the prolapse will just go out again. So it should be of the correct size and the correct type. Okay. So you could also do your pelvic floor muscle training for asymptomatic women. Um, this is usually delivered by a physiotherapist, but you could just ask the patient to do it on her own. Just repeat it 50 times during the day, 50 slowly, 50 fast. You know, just ask them to practice by urinating and trying to control, stop the urination in, in mid-flow. Just think about that. So they are going to do the, the exercise 50 times a day slowly and 50 times fast. And they, they will be able to do that. There will be improvement. And of course, you have your surgery. You could have reconstructive and obliterative procedures. No, So your reconstructive will be your vaginal hysterectomy with AP repair, anterior and posterior repair, depending on whether both the anterior and posterior compartments are affected by the prolapse. Or you could just do obliterative 
the patient doesn't want to have sexual contact anymore. So just close the vaginal opening. Do colpoclysis. So that's what colpoclysis means. Or you could do your uterine preserving surgery. So instead of removing the entire uterus, like with the vaginal hysterectomy, you anchor the uterus to the sacrum, your sacrohysteropexy. Okay, so this is the different levels of support. If you remember your anatomy, the level one will be your uterosacral cardinal ligament complex. Two will be your um, arcus tendinus fascia pelvis. And the third will be the fusion of the perineal body. So again, the defect, as you could see here, so you, you have to, again, try to attain the vaginal support that was lost during the... The, the years, no? So the goals of prolapse surgery are the following, but again, no, if the patient, even if you do the surgery, if you do the correct technique, if the patient is still constipated, the patient is still COPD, the patient is still carrying heavy objects, so the, the prolapse will just recur, okay? And it will now, because if you have removed the uterus, the vault will be the one prolapsing, okay? So the route of, I will not ask you about the, what the operations are, but I just want you to know that we usually remove the entire uterus. So I don't want you to know that anymore. Okay, so this is just an example of a prolapse. So again, no, you try to remove it, hysterectomy by the vagina, and you do your AP repair. And that's the uterus, and that's the finished product. With urinary incontinence, know that what is important is to know what type of urinary incontinence the patient is having. So continence is maintained by um, the maximum urethral pressure will usually exceed the bladder pressure. So the pressure exceeded, uh, produced by the urethra should always exceed the bladder so that if there's a lot of fluid within the bladder, it will exceed that the pressure of the urethra, you will have flow of urine. But again, it's also, com there's, it's not just, um, about pressures or uncontrolled. You can also control the, the urine flow, right? you have cerebral control or function so that the, you can also relax the sphincter muscles on your own. Okay, so that's it, the emptying. So incontinence can be urethral or extra urethral. So it could be because of the sphincter incompetence, the truce instability, or it could be congenital, or it could be because of a fistula. So don't just um, assume that uh, there's a uh, watery discharge it's because of incontinence. No, it could be because of a vesicovaginal fistula or a rectovaginal fistula. Okay, evaluation should be gynecologic. Look for um, your neurologic, assess for anal wink, your pelvic floor muscle contraction, and um, rule out any probability of an infection or stone. So you request for your urine culture, and your analysis, you test, you do your office histometry, you have adequate bladder emptying, the residual volume should always be less than 200. More than 200 is significant residual, and you do your three-day voiding bladder diary for your patients. No? Again, avoid, um, during the three-day bladder diary, tell them to avoid um, intake of food that will in, um, encourage diuresis, like coffee or iced tea during that time. Or you could do your office histometry. Your office histometry is you actually insert a catheter and try to possibly pa passively fill the bladder. Now, taking note the volume where the patient felt the first sensation that, the that they want to avoid, the first desire to avoid, the strong desire to avoid, and the maximum bladder capacity or the, the one where they can freely control, they need to void already. And then once you reach that maximum bladder capacity, you ask the patient to cough okay, to see if there's presence of urinary incontinence, stress urinary incontinence. Okay, so if there is passage of urine immediately during the cough, then you have positive cough stress test. But if, if there's a delay, meaning 5 to 10 second delay before the leakage of urine, then it's not because of stress incontinence. It could be because of overactive bladder. So again, delayed sustained urine loss that cannot be inhibited is suggestive of detrusor instability or your overactive bladder syndrome. 
Your overactive bladder syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. They will usually present with frequency, urgency, with or without incontinence. Overactive bladder is a diagnosis of exclusion because it means you ruled out all the anatomic pathologies that could cause the incontinence of the patient. So it's just overactive bladder. Sometimes you just give them alpha. It's treated um, by uh, medical treatment. Okay, so we also do the Q-tip test. Uh, usually, this will actually be more indicative of urethral hypermobility that could um, uh, contribute to the incontinence of the patient. Your Q-tip test is more likely um, indicative of the response to a possible surgery or your sling surgeries for stress incontinence. Okay, if it's more than 30 degrees than the usual, then it means there's urethral hypermobility. If you stabilize that region of the urethra by a, by a sling procedure, no, the, the, the more it chances that it will heal the incontinence of the patient. Okay? Your systometrogram is the gold standard in diagnosis. I won't teach you how to do that, but suffice it to say, this is what you're going to request for if you're going to... Um, um, evaluate urinary incontinence. So, so stress incontinence is involuntary urine loss during physical exertion or increase in pressure. No, like what happens when you cough, when you laugh, when you laugh, no, or when you strain. Okay, so it's um, it's usually caused by inadequate support of the bladder, neck, and mid urethra that is being tested by your Q-tip test, the hypermobility of the urethra. Okay, so that is the usual cause of your stress incontinence. Your urodynamic stress incontinence, on the other hand, is just um, being, if you request your system metrogram or your urodynamic studies, it's just uh, another term for you to say that your stress incontinence has been documented by urodynamic studies. No, so treatment will be the same. You restore bladder neck support via the sling procedure or your TVTs. Your urge incontinence is involuntary urge or involuntary urine loss with a strong urge to void. So there's urgency. So before there is a leakage of the urine, the patient will actually feel a strong urge to void and they can control it. Usually your urge incontinence will have large volumes of urine loss as compared to your stress incontinence. Okay, you also need to differentiate it from overactive bladder syndrome. No, so how you differentiate it? You do your three-day bladder diary just to show to see if there's overactive bladder syndrome. No, so your overactive bladder is urgency, frequency with or without urge incontinence, excluding infections and other bladder pathologies. No? So it's either provoked or unprovoked. Treatment is usually of your overactive bladder syndrome is lifestyle modifications, bladder retraining. So what is the practical, um, is overactive bladder syndrome really too? It's a diagnosis of exclusion as I've said, but you could actually confirm it with yourselves. No, sometimes when you see, when you travel far and then you see a gas station, no, you try to, even if you don't feel the urge to avoid, suddenly you want to go the CR and void no or likewise when you are in the when you have a lecture that lasted for more than three hours like with what we had no so you have the urge to go to the restroom every one and a half hours or every break no that is overactive bladder syndrome so you do bladder retaining no how do you do bladder retaining you tell you, by your, the patient will do a bladder diary. They will tell you what they drank, how many times they went to the CR, what are the symptoms. So you will see there what is the the interval in between void and how much, how many, how many volume are they excreting? Because sometimes it's just a ma a, a matter of habit that they need to go to the restroom every one hour. Okay, maybe because of boredom or they can't do anything else. No, so. You have to tell them, okay, you have to, there's nothing wrong with you. You just have to retain yourself to try and hold it in one hour and 15 minutes. Now, if she's able to tolerate it in one week's time, and then again, one hour, 30 minutes the next week. Up, your goal is to actually control voiding for at least two hours. Okay. Could also give your anticholinergic, electrical stimulation, and surgery, but it's not always. Um, um, 
does it always work? These are the and uh, drugs that we could give for your overactive bladder syndrome. Okay, thank you. That's it. So, do you have any questions? So that's it. Do you have any? Uh, Ma'am, can we get the PPT? No, the PowerPoint are is just the PowerPoint that I gave you in the in your lectures. No, the only ones that I differentiated are the the what do you call this? The the gyne part, but it's basically the same. Please, 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 I told you. Focus on anatomy and physiology. Huh? Your questions are very, 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 very easy already. Huh? Please take note of that, the, the ones that I, I, I emphasized. The PowerPoints is the same. I just uh, got 10 points from my different PowerPoints that I gave you and just place it in a slide. It's the same PowerPoints. Okay, ma'am. Any other questions? No, so for dystocia, um, please try to again, no, your arrest and failure disorders again for the descent or the uh, wait, I'm going to practice here with the dystocia. For the dystocia, no, so so if you have a, a, a if you have a graph in your case or in your uh, OSCE, no, this slides, no. So the way that I'm going to ask it is take a look at certain points in the slide. So I will ask you. Is there any abnormality from the time of admission, meaning from zero hour up to fourth hour of admission? Okay, so that's how you're going to ascertain that. Is there any abnormality here, like for this case, from the, from the time of admission to the fourth hour, is there any abnormality with the dilatation and the descent? Is this normal or abnormal? Please answer so that I know if you... No, there's nothing wrong because your patient is still in the latent phase. So you won't expect the dilatation to be since she, she you know, she's a primary gravid. So you're going to expect the dilatation to be at least 1 cm per hour. You know? So if you see this, 2, 3, it's already been 4 hours. You know? So you don't expect dilatation to be at least um, 4 centimeters in 4 hours because she's still in the latent phase. But by the moment she reached here from the 11th, okay, to 13th hour, is there something wrong? 11th to 13th hour, can you diagnose that? 11th to 13th hour, is there something wrong with the dilatation? So from the 11th to the 13th hour, she, she was 4 centimeters, then at the 13th hour, she is 5 centimeters. So is there something wrong? Yes, ma'am. What is that? Uh, what is wrong? What is wrong? Is that slow dilatation? Is that arrest? No dilatation at all? Or is that normal? Arrest, doctor. Is that a rest from the 11th to 13th? See, she's 4 centimeters. On the 13th hour, she became 5 centimeters. Mm -hmm. There should be 1 centimeter per hour, right? 
one centimeter per hour dilatation. So at the 13th hour, she should be six centimeters at least, but she's only five. So what do you call that? Slow dilatation. Is it slow dilatation? Is that the term that we discussed earlier? It's a rise, ma'am. It's rise. Rise? Is there a rise? Is there a term that I said rise in dilatation? Uh, what term did I use in the in the table? Starting with yes. Yes, what is it? There is protracted dilatation. Okay, your diagnosis is not slow, pro slow dilatation, that is not the term. The term is protracted cervical dilatation. Okay, so from the 11th to 13th hour, you have protracted cervical dilatation already. How about in this part? Hmm. From the 9th hour to the 10th hour, what happened? The patient reached full cervical dilatation, but at the 9th to 10th hour, it's still plus 1 to plus 2. So what is that dilatation? Okay, what Arrest. is that problem in the descent? Is it arrest or failure in the descent? Arrest. Arrest, arrest of the descent. Arrest of descent. Okay, it's arrest of descent. Remember, if you are arrested by a policeman, you, you were stopped. Okay, so see here at the deceleration phase, which I said happens at seven centimeters, it started to go down, right? So it went down. So correct, it went down. But after it went down, it stopped. So it was arrested. So it's arrest in descent. It's not failure because it failure means it never went down. Okay? It never went down past station zero. Do you understand? Huh? So yes, your descent disorders is not diagnosed until you reach seven, at least seven centimeters. Okay, before seven centimeters, all of the abnormalities will be regarding dilatation. Okay, dilatation of the cervix. After seven centimeters, it could be regarding dilatation of the cervix or descent of the head. You understand? Oh, next, what about this one? From the 10th to 13th hour, what is your diagnosis? 10th to 13th hour. The 10th to 13th hour. Look, she's only six centimeters dilated. From the 10th to 13th hour, what is your diagnosis? Guys, uh, dog arrest of the cervical di dilation. Okay, arrest in cervical dilatation. Correct. What are you going to do? It's already been four hours. You do cesarean. Okay, cesarean section. Very good. How about this one? See, oh, you are past your. The patient is already fully dilated. You're already in the second stage of labor, but the Station, it's still at minus one. Minus one. It never went past zero. So what is this? Failure of descent. Okay, failure of descent. Thank you. Huh? So that's failure of descent. So it's very easy, correct? Huh? Very, very easy. The next thing that you should be able to take note of is knowing what antenatal test you're going to request for in a patient who is pregnant. Now, how are you going to know what type of test are you going to request for in a patient who is, for example, 36 weeks with hypertension, with a small fundic height? You want to know how the baby is. No? So she has hypertension, the baby is small, so you want to know whether the baby is really small. No, You can't just rely on the fundic height, so you do your biometry and your BPS to take note of any hypoxia. And because the patient is hypertensive, there's a vascular component to it. No, You have, may have problems with the blood vessel. Then you can request for your Doppler velocimetry. 
Okay, so please try to memorize what the BPS is, how you're going to score the BPS. Okay, how the modified BPS, what are the components of your modified, modified BPS? Your EFM, please just know the terminologies and how to interpret uh, your antepartum test, your NST, reactive or non-reactive, your CST, positive, negative, hyperstimulation, or equivocal, or unsatisfactory. And then you have your EFM, diba? normal, suspicious, or pathologic trace. Okay, do you have any questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Guys. Okay, your exam is very, very easy. It's like for the first year only. So please, I, I, I wish you luck, everybody. Okay, and always stay safe. Huh? Did, did, no questions anymore? No, ma'am. No, no? Okay, are you sure? Okay, if there's no more questions, we'll end the session. Good luck, everybody. Huh? Stay Mom. safe. Yes. Uh, what we discussed today, exam will be from there, right? Yes, from there. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, and please study your anatomy. Your anatomy should always be inside your head. I, I can't emphasize it enough. Okay? That's why I reviewed it also in your um, gynecology part. Okay? Thank you, everybody. Anatomy and physiology, of course, because that is where pathology will come from. Okay? Okay. So if there's no more questions, goodbye, everybody. Stay safe, huh? Take care. Good luck. Bye-bye.